right? Last time we were talking about how reactions happen, and by that we mean in what order are the bonds formed versus broken. And so for a substitution reaction, we came up with this mechanistic hypothesis where we lose the leaving group first, and then uh, the nucleophile in a second step reacts with a carbocationic intermediate. And uh, we, we reasoned that because the first step involves only bond breaking, that that would be uphill and slow, whereas the second step involves only, down, only bond making, so that should be downhill and fast. We talked about how there are transition states that separate each of these starting materials and intermediates, or intermediates and products. Uh, and these transition states look somewhere along the way in between the starting material and the intermediate. And they're higher in energy because uh, there's some structural rearrangement that has to happen as the atoms uh, move along the reaction coordinate between uh, starting material and intermediate or between intermediate and product. We talked about how the leaving group just leaving is a matter of getting enough energy to escape this potential energy well and go to a sort of infinite distance between the carbon and the iodide. Uh, and then we talked about how in the second step when the nucleophile attacks the carbocation, that that involves homo attacking lumo and the lumo on the carbocation is the empty p orbital. Uh, and so uh, because this first step is the slow step, it is the rate determining step, and we talked about how that means that only molecules that participate in the first step can show up in the rate law. So we would expect a rate that is linearly dependent on the concentration of your starting material, methyl iodide, in the first step. Uh, but because the nucleophile isn't involved in that rate limiting or rate determining step, uh, we would expect to see that the reaction was independent of nucleophile concentration. Now, I introduced a couple of terms that you may or may not have heard before. I said that the linear dependence of rate on the amount of methyl iodide means the reaction is first order in methyl iodide. First order just refers to the fact that in the rate law, the exponent on the concentration term for methyl iodide is one. So that's what first order means. Uh, similarly, why do we say zero order in the concentration of uh, nucleophile? Well, because if you want to write the concentration of nucleophile in there, but communicate that the reaction is independent, you can give it an exponent of zero and then that takes care of it, right? So that's zero order in nucleophile or independent of nucleophile. Okay, we said that because there's only one molecule of your starting material that's involved in the rate determining step, that this is a unimolecular mechanism. And so we call this unimolecular nucleophilic substitution, or SN1. We're not done with SN1 because we need to talk about some of the, uh, based on our understanding of mechanism, how the products might tell us whether or not an SN1 reaction had occurred. But before we do that, I want to talk about our second mechanistic hypothesis. Um, I also want to pause and say that this mechanism that we have proposed that occurs in a couple of steps, we will call stepwise in organic chemistry. And we're gonna cross, uh, we're gonna contrast that with reactions that are concerted. A stepwise reaction is where bond making and bond breaking steps don't happen all at the same time. A concerted reaction is where they do happen in the same step in the same transition state and so on. So that's our summary of what we did last time. Any more questions you have as you've thought about what all of this means? Hmm. I don't believe you, but we'll get to your questions later, I guess. You'll come up with some, I'm sure. All right, second mechanistic hypothesis. Seriously, no questions about SN1? It's okay. Feeling pretty good? Your overconfidence will be your undoing. Um, mechanistic hypothesis two is that we break the carbon iodide bond and we make the new carbon carbon bond at the same time in the same step. That mechanism is a concerted step. 
Now, uh, I've drawn a transition state for this reaction in which the leaving group is leaving with a partial negative charge on it and the nucleophile is coming in. And at some point along the way, the carbon has to change its geometry because the nucleophile is coming in uh, exactly opposite from where the leaving group is leaving. So do you see how um, prior to the reaction, the carbon is sp2 hybridized and the angle between where the um, leaving group is and where that first carbon hydrogen bond is, is the tetrahedral angle 109.5 or whatever, right? And do you see how after the reaction where the nucleophile has come in on the other side, that angle is again 109.5. Something's had to happen, right? That hydrogen has to pop from this direction to that direction. And intermediate uh, or midway along that pathway is where you have something where the angle between the departing iodide and the hydrogen in question is about 90 degrees and the angle between the incoming nucleophile and the hydrogen in question is about 90 degrees. In other words, what I'm trying to communicate by this issue of angles is just that as the reaction progresses, the carbon has to change its hybridization. It almost goes to an sp2 hybridized sort of flat shape, and then the hydrogens pop back the other way. Okay, um, let's talk about this proposed mechanism in terms of HOMO and LUMO. The CN minus, as before, is the nucleophile, and the HOMO is going to be lone pairs on the carbon. How about the methyl iodide? What is the LUMO of this electrophile? the Ci sigma star, the antibonding orbital, right? So maybe I'll just redraw methyl iodide here with the orbital on it so that you can have an idea of what this looks like. Here are those two hydrogens, here's the other one. The LUMO is going to involve a node in between the two atoms. Uh, lobes on either side of that node with opposite wave function sign, which we'll use pink and orange, and then a large lobe on the back where carbon is, another large lobe on the back where iodide is. So, uh, if you were to draw HOMO attacking LUMO, here's CN minus, it would make sense to draw an arrow from the lone pair electrons on the chloro to the sigma star, right? Now, the sigma star is on two atoms, both carbon and iodide. Which one are you going to draw it to? You're going to draw it to carbon. Why is that? It actually doesn't have to do with electronegativity. If you look up the numbers, iodide's not that much more or less electronegative than carbon. In this case, it's all about what happens after you attack the sigma star. If I attack at carbon, I form a new carbon-carbon bond, and the iodide leaves. I minus is the conjugate base of a strong acid. I'll, I don't need to draw that again because the products are shown above. I minus, the leaving group, is the conjugate base of a strong acid, which makes it stable with a negative charge, which means, which means it's actually an excellent leaving group. It's fine on its own. In contrast, if we were to attack at iodide, the thing that left would be CH3 minus, which is the conjugate base of the most terrible acid you can think of, because it's pKa is 50, right? So there's a clear choice, right? You have to attack at the carbon so you get the better leaving group. All right, now, um, knowing that, and knowing that the LUMO attacks, uh, sorry, the HOMO attacks the LUMO at carbon, 
you begin to see why I chose for the nucleophile to come in 180 degrees away or directly in reverse or directly in, on the backside of the carbon iodide bond, right? Because that's where the sigma star is. Homo attacks lumo, that's the direction you're gonna come at. You might say, well, why couldn't I attack from the front side? Well, there's a node right there. There's no orbital to overlap with there, okay? Um, another potential explanation is that if I attack on the back side, the, that, geo that reaction geometry keeps the partial negative charges as far apart as possible in the transition state. In contrast, if I had attacked from the front side, the leaving group and the negatively charged nucleophile would repel each other. Okay, so this is a feature of the mechanism we're proposing. It's concerted. The reactions happen at the same time, and another key feature is because HOMO is attacking LUMO, the nucleophile comes in on the backside of where the leaving group is leaving, backside attack. That's going to have some consequences a little bit later on that we'll get to as we try to think about how you might know whether a reaction was SN1 versus what I'm proposing now. Any questions so far? Yes. So you can't, you can't attack where there's a node? You can't attack where there's a node, right, because HOMO overlapping with LUMO is two orbitals interacting with each other. The wave functions have to overlap with the same wave function sign. Yeah? So it's called a back side attack because it's coming from the other side? That's right. If this is where the nucleophile is, the backside is 180 degrees opposite that CI bond. Yeah, others, yes? Is there only one that's observed or is reality a mix? We're gonna see it's context dependent, which is probably something you hate, right? We want something to always be one way or the other. It turns out it will depend on a few things. It's gonna depend on the identity of your leaving group. It's gonna depend on the identity of the carbon that's attached to the leaving group. And it's gonna depend on the identity of the nucleophile. We'll work through all of that, and you'll have a pretty systematic way of predicting what's going to happen, whether it's going to be one or the other. Yep. Okay, what else? Yeah. Why is it important to know that it attacks from the backside? Why is it important to know that it attacks from the backside? Uh, it has stereochemical consequences. Stay tuned, because I am going to talk about that. Yep, what else? Yeah. So yeah, if you've, if you've read ahead, one of the things that might prevent this type of reaction, this concerted reaction from happening, is if the things here that are hydrogens are actually very large. They could get so large that it would be very difficult for the nucleophile to even get to the sigma star. Yep, we'll talk about that for sure. Okay, well, uh, let's really quickly draw an, uh, uh, Reaction coordinate energy diagram for this reaction here is energy and again on the x-axis we have something that just means reaction progress. There are no intermediates so we're going to go from starting materials to products. Uh, you could show through bond dissociation enthalpies like we've talked about before that the products are more stable than the starting materials. You're going to go from starting materials to products through a single transition state, uh, and that transition state would look like what we've drawn above. So um, a single step mechanism, the energy diagram is actually pretty straightforward. There's only one hill to go over. Uh, of course, because there's only one hill to go over, there's only one activation energy that matters. There's only one rate determining step. So the rate, because, of, because this reaction only has one step and there are two molecules participating in that rate determining step, the rate here would depend both on the concentration of methyl iodide and on the concentration of the nucleophile. In other words, if you were to do an experiment where you varied the concentration of methyl iodide and then observed the rate, you would expect to see linear dependence of rates on concentration of methyl iodide. And then if you did that same experiment for CN minus the nucleophile, 
In contrast to the SN1 reaction, you would expect to see linear dependence on uh, CN minus. We would say that the reaction is first order in methyl iodide because in the rate law, the exponent on the methyl iodide concentration is one. We would say that the reaction is first order in CN minus concentration <coughs> because the exponent on the CN minus concentration term in the rate law is one. But we would say that the rate law is second order overall because there are two concentration terms in the rate law, right? And so we'd say that the reaction is bimolecular because again, in the rate determining step, there are two molecules, bimolecular nucleophilic substitution is where we get the term SN2, okay? So, uh, and, and by the way, that's a potential moment for confusion. If you get mixed up, it's kind of confusing that the SN1 reaction is two steps, <laughs> but the SN2 reaction is just one step. The one and the two have to do with how many molecules are in the rate determining step. Okay. All right. So now that we've got that in place, Let's think about how, uh, aside from the rate experiment, so if you, if you had a reaction and you didn't know what the mechanism was, the first thing you would do is these rate experiments. You'd have some way to measure rate and you'd see how the rate depended on the concentration of your starting materials. You wanna know more about how to do that? Take chemistry 552, right? And we'll talk a lot about that. Um, but, uh, and, and if you saw a unimolecular dependence only on methyl iodide, you'd conclude, okay, this has got to be an SN1 type reaction. If you saw bimolecular dependence on methyl iodide and CN minus, you would say, okay, this has got to be an SN2 reaction. But there are other clues as well. In science, we like to have multiple ways of getting at a problem. And one of the key ways to assess mechanism is by the stereochemical outcome of the reaction. So let's, um, as a way to, to probe mechanism. So let's think about that for the SN1 reaction. And let's start, <clears throat> I'm gonna actually show you a real SN1 reaction. Um, we're going to start with a molecule that is chiral. Okay, just to again review some stuff from chapter five, that molecule is chiral. You can tell it's chiral because it's not the same as its mirror image. It only has one stereocenter, and shortcut for determining chirality is if you can identify one and only one stereocenter, the molecule has to be chiral. Is that molecule an enantiomer? Um, an enantiomer of what? Well, is it the enantiomer of its mirror image? Absolutely. Okay, um, so continue to work on that because that's important. This molecule is chiral, this is our electrophile, and our nucleophile is going to be water. You'll see that water is actually not a very strong nucleophile. That's going to play into our determination of whether a reaction mechanism is SN1 or SN2. Uh, but let's say for now, we know that the reaction is uh, SN1. Uh, in the end, our products are going to be, well, we got to predict the products. So let's suppose this mechanism is SN1, though I will tell you that water is going to be your nucleophile. Now, in the SN1 reaction, the, leaving, the bond between carbon and the leaving group breaks first. So, our mechanism for this reaction would involve, first, the leaving group leaving. I'm going to draw for a moment the carbon-hydrogen bond that's implied but not shown, and I'm going to show you the leaving group leaving to give you a carbocationic intermediate. And then your leaving group. 
Now tell me about that carbocationic intermediate. Does it have a stereo center? Is it chiral? No. So one of the consequences of the first step of the SN1 reaction is you lose the stereocenter. Let's be precise about that. If there was a stereocenter elsewhere in the molecule, you wouldn't lose that stereocenter. You lose this stereocenter because that's the stereocenter where the leaving group was. Once the leaving group leaves, it's not a stereocenter anymore. Right? Uh, the reason you can tell that is because that carbon is now sp2 hybridized. It's trigonal planar and it's flat. Now, uh, let's talk about the next step. Step two, which is the step where the nucleophile comes in and attacks the LUMO of the electrophile. So, positively charged carbon. In this second step, water comes in and attacks. Um, now, let's talk again about what the LUMO of that electrophile is. What is it? The LUMO of the carbocation. Okay, a p orbital on carbon, on the positively charged carbon. Uh, I'm gonna draw this from our top view, looking straight down at this molecule. These carbon, hydrogen, carbon, carbon bonds are all in the same plane, the plane of the page. A p orbital, the empty p orbital, what does that look like? Well, you've got one lobe above the plane of the page coming out at you, and then you have another lobe below the plane of the page. Uh, and if it would be helpful, we can draw a side view so that you can remind yourself of what this would look like. If this is the plane of the page from our side view, then uh, you've got the carbon-hydrogen bond here, a carbon-carbon bond there. Oops. Another carbon-carbon bond there. Here is the lobe of the p orbital that's above the plane of the page. And then here is the lobe of the p orbital that's below the plane of the page. Sorry. Color. And then just because I love you, we're going to shade in the gray so that you can tell the orange stuff is below the plane of the page. All right. So tell me, is there any difference in those two lobes of the p orbital above and below the plane of the page? I mean, they have different wave function sign, but is there any reason why the nucleophile would prefer one versus the other? No, not at all. Those two faces of the carbocation are identical. That means that the nucleophile, and maybe this is easier to see uh, here, that nucleophile can either attack from above or below. Lone pair electrons on the oxygen may attack the carbocation from either side. In fact, there can be no preference. The two faces of that carbocation are identical. I'm just going to draw one arrow here to avoid confusion. But keeping in mind that the, the oxygen uh, on the water can attack from above or below, Let's think about what the products would be. If water attacks from above, where should my oxygen go here? Should it be a dash or a wedge? If it attacks from above, above the plane of the page. A wedge, right? Now, is that now a stereo center? Yep. Is that chiral? Okay. So here's a good point that will help you as you think about reactions. If you have an intermediate that is not chiral, but a product that is, there is no such thing as ex nihilo chirality in organic chemistry. You can't get it from nowhere, right? So if your intermediate is achiral, is not chiral, but your products are and you just made a stereocenter, you needed to have made both enantiomers. 
The only way you can get preference for one enantiomer over another is if your intermediate was chiral or if your reagent was chiral. We'll talk about that a little bit more as time goes on. So where does the other enantiomer come from? Attack from below, right? So if we attack from below the plane of the page, we're going to get the chiral other enantiomer, okay? Now, um, what's the ratio between those two enantiomers? What does it have to be? Has to be one to one, has to be racemic, or this has to be a racemate. We have to make a one to one mixture. Why? Because our intermediate was not chiral, okay? Now, what happens at this point? Your nucleophile came in. Because it was water, you made three bonds to oxygen, and now it's positively charged. Your text will say that in the last step, you remove a proton from that positively charged uh, oxygen to make it neutral. The thing that does the proton removal, one of the things I didn't tell you is that in this step, you're probably using water as solvents, so there's a vast excess of water. Your text will sometimes show you Br minus doing the deprotonating. That's okay. I don't like it for pKa reasons that should be clear to you. Um, it should be, since you know that the pKa of an oxygen that's positively charged with a proton on it is around minus two, it shouldn't make a huge amount of sense to take Br minus and deprotonate because this is actually just a chapter two problem. Is Br minus a strong enough base to remove that proton? Well, let's answer that. Minus two, what's the, how do we judge the strength of the base? Look at its conjugate acid. What's the pKa of HBr minus nine? How reasonable is that? In water, probably not. In organic solvent, who knows? But what I prefer to do I, uh, is to show probably a second molecule of water. And I'm only gonna do this once on one of the two molecules, though it happens for both of them. Removes the proton there at least uh, I make hydronium, which has about the same pKa as the oxonium ion I just deprotonated. So yeah, probably you're going to make both enantiomers, and then you're going to have H3O+. Plus. Um, your text might show you making HBr. That's fine, but because, as I've said, I don't, I pre I don't prefer it for reasons that I've just described. Okay. So, what is the key stereochemical outcome of an SN1 reaction? Your starting material was chiral and you had a stereocenter, but your products, as we've shown you, based on your understanding of HOMO and LUMO and what the MPP orbital looks like, your product is a racemate. So, you get loss of... Um, I'm not sure how to describe this. You get loss of exclusive stereochemical configuration. You started with all of one enantiomer and you get a mixture of both enantiomers. Not only a mixture, but a one-to-one -one mixture of both enantiomers. I don't want to say loss of chirality. That's not technically correct because each of those enantiomers is chiral, but you do lose um, optical activity, you do lose enantiomeric excess. Even if you started with 100% of this pure enantiomer, you would get a one-to-one -one mixture of these two products. Yes? So, will it always be a one-to-one? -one? Yes. Will it always be one-to-one? -one? Well, what do you mean by always? That uh, if your intermediate is not chiral, then yes, it would always be a one-to-one -one mixture. Will your intermediate always be not chiral? You're, you're really tempting fate here because now I've got to answer your question and your question can be much more complicated than that. So you don't like this and that's fine. You won't like this and that's fine. Uh, okay, that molecule is chiral, right? However, the leaving group is only at one, so let's just imagine this was an SN1 mechanism. The leaving group is only at one, I'm sorry, at, the leaving group is at a stereocenter, but that is not the only stereocenter in the molecule. 
Therefore, when the leaving group leaves, let me draw the intermediate for you. That intermediate is still uh, sp2 hybridized and planar at the carbocation, but there's adjacent there's an adjacent stereo center. Now you can see if we look at HOMO versus uh, if we look at what the LUMO of this molecule is, and it's the p orbital that is on one side of the page and the other side of the page. Now hopefully you can see the two faces are not the same, right? The top face has a T-butyl group sticking out onto it. The bottom face doesn't. So there's a difference, and that means there can be a preference in the next step for the nucleophile to attack one face versus the other. Um, this is actually a decent stereochemical exercise, so I'm going to continue on with it. If our nucleophile attacks the positively charged carbon, let's look at what the products would be. Attack from above, ultimately, I'm not showing you the deprotonation step. Attack from above would give you this product. Attack from below <coughs> would give you this product. Now, I'm like, I'm like rejoicing with evil delight inside at the complexity of this problem because it allows us to ask some interesting questions. What's the relationship between those two products? Diastereomers. Do diastereomers... Uh, Enantiomers have to have the same chemical and physical properties. Diastereomers don't. Chemical and physical properties means also stability and rate of formation. These two diastereomers could form, one could form faster than the other or one could be more stable than the other. These do not have to be one-to-one. -one. In fact, you might expect a preference for one over the other. Um, I haven't actually done this experiment. Um, one can be preference, that's, sorry, that's not a word. One can be preferred over the other. I haven't actually done this experiment and so I need to look up an example where we have real uh, ratios. If I were, you know, betting, I would predict that this one would be more stable. I'm so, or rather, sorry, I would predict that this one would be the major enantiomer. Whether it, uh, I need to back that up. I would predict this one would be the major product, the major diastereomer. There's a couple reasons for that that aren't important for our discussion. But the point is, you know, is it always one to one? Well, no. If your intermediate is still chiral, then your products will be diastereomers, not enantiomers, and they don't have to be one to one. Okay? All right, that was kind of fun ish. Painful. All right, so loss of configuration at a stereo center is evidence for SN1. And, and again, even if these two were not formed in one to one, the fact that I started out with 100% of this configuration, but I get a mixture of products, is evidence for a carbocationic intermediate. Now, let's do SN2 and see how that contrasts. This is very important. Because frankly, when I ask you to show me the products of a reaction, you're going to need to have mastered this issue so that the products you draw accurately communicate your understanding of the mechanism. I'll give you an example of that in a little bit. Let's consider the SN2 mechanism. And here, the key issue is we don't have a non-chiral intermediate. We don't have a carbocation. We have a transition state that looks like this. And we also know that the nucleophile has to come in from the back side. So let's consider what that does. Now, it's unfortunately the way to show backside attack, like from, from this perspective. That, that, that shows you the backside attack in the most clear way possible, but interpreting stereochemistry from that perspective is a little problematic. So I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna actually start with this view of the molecule. We're gonna just do a standard view of the molecule where we're looking at it like this, okay? 
If you, if you wanted to, you know, you could redraw this molecule and try to get the stereochemistry exactly right. Uh, um, I think that would be this and a proton here and a methyl group there. Um, you can do that, but I've had students struggle with visualizing molecules um, if you try to do it this way. So I'm just going to sort of put that over here in the corner and we're going to forget about it. But if you want to come back to the notes and look at it and do it that way, you can. Now, here is the same chiral starting material. In this case, we're going to use OH- as a nucleophile. OH- is a much better nucleophile than water for reasons that you can probably rationalize based on the pKa's of their conjugate acids. Um, what is backside attack going to look like? Well, you have to use your imagination. Uh, you have to see that the carbon-bromine bond is angled up toward the top of the page but coming out at you. So 180 degrees away from that is going to be below the page uh, and angled down towards this direction. So I'm going to show backside attack as the nucleophile comes in from this direction and I'm going to understand that I mean from below the plane of the page. As the leaving group leaves, remembering that um, the nucleophile is coming in from below the plane of the page, as the leaving group leaves and the nucleophile comes in, this hydrogen, which was pointed below the plane of the page, is going to have to tilt up into the plane of the page so that we get some transition state like this, where it's basically sp two hybridized. And as the nucleophile continues to come in and the leaving group leaves, that hydrogen below the plane of the page is actually going to pop up to be above the plane of the page. So in our product, the hydrogen is here and the oxygen ends up here. Now I know some of you are thinking, hold on, you said it was backside attack and that means that my oxygen ought to be angled downward. And I'm like, yes, you're, you're right, though. We have tilted the molecule again to have it make sense. All right? If you want to, <clears throat> I don't necessarily recommend this, but if what I've just described is troubling you, then go ahead and show the oxygen attacking from this side backside attack. What I'm showing you here is fully equivalent to what I drew above and if you use a model set and are careful enough you can convince yourself that that's true. You would go through a transition state that looked like this and then your product should be oops, this. OH on this side, okay. I told you that you wouldn't like it. Uh, it's easiest to draw an SN2 reaction like this and to note that backside attack switches the configuration of the stereocenter. If this approach makes the most sense to you, that's fine. You just need to draw and make a model and convince yourself that this view of the molecule is identical to this one, and this view of the molecule is actually identical to this, okay? But the point is, the consequence of the SN2 backside attack is that backside attack leads to inversion of configuration. I want to be precise about that. What do I mean by inversion of configuration? Well, if the leaving group was down or up, sorry, if the leaving group was down, ah, why can't I get that right? I always get, I get left and right wrong the first time every time too. I don't know what's going on. Uh, the leaving group here, bromo, was a wedge pointed up. In the product, the nucleophile is down, okay? Now, some of you are thinking, oh, I know, if I assign R and S, then if an SN2 reaction happened, the stereocenter will have switched from R to S. In general, that's going to work. 
if, if your leaving group was the highest priority group on that stereo center and if the incoming nucleophile is also the highest priority group on that stereo center. Then the RS switch is gonna work. If priority switches though, then some weird things can happen. It, uh, just in terms of assigning R versus S. So I hesitate to give you a rule that says SN2 always switches R to S and S to R. Um, it will honestly depend on the priority of the leaving group relative to the other groups on that carbon and the priority of the nucleophile in the product relative to the other groups on that carbon. Best to just remember it switches configuration so that if one group was up in the product, it's going to be down. Okay? So this is important, right? Because if I ask you to predict products and you think the mechanism is SN2, and your starting material is chiral, you better show me one and only one of the two possible enantiomers. You get this, I don't know why I'm writing in green. Um, you get this single enantiomer, not the other one. It's 100% this. And, oops, it's 100% the enantiomer I've shown and 0% of that other enantiomer, okay? So if, uh, if you draw, if you, if you think the mechanism is SN2 and you draw for me this product, that tells me you sort of knew that SN2 leads to a chiral product if the starting material is chiral but you have no idea what inversion of configuration means. If you show me both enantiomers, that tells me that you have no idea what SN2 means because you think you make both enantiomers, which is what happens in the SN1 mechanism. Yeah. Stereochemical outcome is the consequence of the mechanism, and so how you deal with that tells me how you understand the mechanism. But this also provides an experiment we can go in the lab and do to determine whether a reaction is SN1 or not or SN2 or not. We start with a chiral material. If we get just the one enantiomer with inversion of configuration, then sure, the mechanism was SN2. If we get both enantiomers and we lose that configuration, then we say, okay, the mechanism was SN1. Okay, yes? How did we figure we were gonna have backside attack for SN2? That has to do with homo lumo, two things actually. Uh, we want to attack the LUMO at carbon for reasons we discussed, and at the carbon, the LUMO is actually in reverse of the carbon iodide bond, or the carbon leaving group bond. And what about the, uh, the second reaction? The second reaction here? Yeah. Right. Where is the LUMO there? Um, probably, hmm. Right, so is your question, where is the LUMO here? No? If we're going to have 100% of one of the enantiomers, then like, the reaction would be at the end of the lot? That's right. How, how did we decide to do uh, backside versus frontside? Backside versus frontside. That goes back to what we were talking about for what um, the SN1 reaction's like. Uh, there are two reasons why the nucleophile comes in from the back. One is that if it does so, the, you keep the negatively charged nucleophile as far apart from the negatively charged leaving group as possible. So that's a charge-charge repulsion issue. The second reason why it has to be backside attack is because this reaction involves the homo of the nucleophile attacking the lumo of the electrophile at carbon so you can get the good leaving group and where that LUMO is on carbon is on the backside. Okay, yep, I think that's that confused with the top side. Okay, yep, good. All right, so stereochemical complexity, yes. No, go ahead. Why did we decide to use OH as a Why did we decide to use hydroxide? Because I wanted this reaction to be realistic when you go back having learned more to come back here and find things are consistent. I told you that whether a reaction is SN1 or SN2 is gonna depend on 
the structure of the, the identity of your leaving group, the structure of the carbon, and on the identity of the nucleophile. Uh, if you compare the SN1 reaction above with the SN2 reaction below, the only difference is the nucleophile. You're going to see that in general, strong nucleophiles, when they can, will prefer SN2 uh, because if you think about the SN1 reaction, the nucleophile has to wait around for the leaving group to leave and then it comes in and attacks. Whereas in the SN2 reaction, the nucleophile attacks directly. Uh, all other things being equal, strong nucleophiles aren't going to need to wait around to attack. They're going to be reactive enough to attack directly. Yeah, so that's why uh, for SN1 I used water as a nucleophile, but for SN2 I used hydroxide. We'll have lots more chance to talk about that. Yeah. The front side versus back side attack is based on two things. First, where the LUMO is, as I said, the nucleophile must attack at the carbon so that you can get the better leaving group. And at the carbon, the LUMO is on the backside. Yep. <clears throat> the other reason is that if you do backside attack, that keeps the lead departing leaving group as far apart as possible from the incoming nucleophile, and that minimizes charge repulsion. Now, I'm about to throw, pull back the curtain on something that you didn't want to know, but it's time you knew it. Uh, all right? So, oh, there's Adam. <laughs> he doesn't look like that anymore, but this is what happens when you let a child get a hold of a device. I got lots of photos on my phone of him in church doing that. Um, thanks, but anyway, now I'm distracted. Uh, so we're going to go to Spar Spartan, and I'm going to draw the molecule I just barely drew. We're going to put a bromo here, and then I'm going to hope that they have, yep, this is in the database. Now, I'm going to draw, I'm going to show you the LUMO. I'm going to turn the LUMO off again. Look at the carbon bromide bond. Bromide is that sort of deep red orange group with the long carbon bromo bond on it. Now we're going to show you the LUMO again. That LUMO, do you see how it's a sigma star? You've got a node in between the carbon and the bromide. You've got other nodes at carbon and bromide. Uh, you've got most of the LUMO on the carbon. Now, if you're paying attention, you see that there is LUMO elsewhere. In fact, I want to focus in on the right hand side of this molecule, you see a red lobe of LUMO on a hydrogen. So that actually tells you that for the molecule I just drew, there's more than one place that a nucleophile could attack. The substitution reaction I just showed you involved the nucleophile attacking at the blue lobe on the back side of the carbon. But there is another spot that we need to worry about. And that spot is involved in all the reactions in chapter 8. Now, I need to tell you that the way the text deals with these reactions is first, the text talks about substitution reactions in chapter 7. All the while, knowing that what I'm about to tell you next time was going on in the background, but we're going to pretend like it didn't happen. I'm going to disclose it all up front and just show you all the horrible complexity and then we're going to make sense of it all together as opposed to teaching you about SN1 and SN2 as though you didn't have to worry about this other possibility uh, and then just lowering the boom on, it, on you at the end. Having that LUMO on that adjacent hydrogen on the, on the left side, that's going to lead to what's called an elimination reaction and we'll talk about that next time. All right. Have a good weekend, pulling that one over, and I'll see you Monday. <laughs>